My name is Padma Jaganesh and I'm the learning specialist at the Alzheimer's Society of Calgary. The first segment of this presentation is on dementia. So we'll be talking about what exactly is dementia, what are the different types of dementia and what are the signs and symptoms. Why should we learn about dementia? The numbers on the screen will tell you why. Currently, there are approximately 564,000 Canadians diagnosed with dementia. This is just the number of people who are living with a diagnosis. There are several more who do not have a diagnosis yet, but are experiencing the symptoms. And the actual number of people impacted by dementia is actually much higher than the 564,000. It's believed that for every individual who is diagnosed with dementia, there are at least 10 to 12 people around them who are actually impacted by the disease. If you thought that dementia is a disease that affects the very old, that is not correct. Five to 10% of individuals living with a diagnosis of dementia are under the age of 65. Right here in Calgary, there are approximately 13,000 individuals living with a diagnosis of dementia. Age seems to be an important risk factor for dementia. What we see is that at the age of 60, 65, one in 11 people can be diagnosed with dementia. Whereas when we go up to the age of 80 and above, one in three people can have dementia. Dementia seems to be a disease that disproportionately affects women in comparison with men. The lifetime risk of developing dementia happens to be one in five among women, whereas it is one in 10 among men. So what exactly is dementia? Dementia refers to progressive general decline in mental ability that is sufficiently severe to interfere with daily life. Mental ability refers to several elements. It includes ability to remember, ability to learn, ability to think, ability to make decisions, ability to carry on with the activities of daily living, ability to communicate, and so on. Therefore, dementia is an umbrella term that refers to progressive difficulty in all these areas. So we have the dementia umbrella, and below the dementia umbrella are all the symptoms that are commonly associated with dementia. The most common presenting symptom of dementia is memory loss. And this memory loss is very unique. It refers to memory loss of recent events, recently acquired information, and so on. Therefore, a person with dementia might be able to remember things from their past very clearly, but may not remember whether they had uh, a meal or not, and what did they exactly have at that meal, or they might forget a recent conversation. So in this way, it is difficult, different from the memory loss that is associated with normal aging. As, as part of growing older, a person might forget some information here and there. For example, if there was an appointment, the person would remember the appointment, but might forget a few details here and there. Whereas in the case of someone with dementia, they would forget the event altogether. So that is a way in which the memory loss associated with dementia is different from the memory loss associated with normal aging. Another common symptom associated with dementia is impaired judgment and reasoning. This simply means difficulty making decisions on a daily basis. It could be as simple as not knowing how to dress for the weather. For example, on a cold snowy day, a person with dementia might just walk out in their indoor clothes. Or it could be more complex as having difficulty making the right decision when there are several choices available. So for example, when a person with dementia goes to a restaurant, um, whereas previously he or she used to make her own decision about what to eat, now that the person has dementia, the person gets confused and overwhelmed by the variety of choices and is unable to make a decision 
and would ask someone else to make their decision for them. Another common symptom associated with dementia is communication difficulties. And this includes difficulty expressing oneself and difficulty understanding what another person is telling. And what we have observed in a multicultural society like Calgary is that immigrants who have learned English language at a later stage in their life are more likely to forget English vocabulary when they develop dementia and they are very likely to revert back to their mother tongue. Another common symptom associated with dementia is visuospatial impairment. It includes two components, difficulty with visual perception and difficulty understanding the spatial distribution of objects. Talking about difficulty with visual perception, even though we are seeing with our eyes, it's actually a part of the brain in the back of the brain called the occipital lobe that processes all the visual signals. So a person with dementia might have difficulty recognizing what they are actually seeing. For example, if there is a dark shadow on the ground, a person with dementia might think that it is a deep dark hole and might refuse to step on that area. Or if the floor is too shiny, the person might think that it is a wet floor and they would refuse to walk there. Also in conditions where there is a lack of contrast, a person with dementia could have difficulty recognizing objects. For example, if there is a white toilet against a white wall, a person with dementia might have difficulty recognizing the toilet and might have uh, therefore difficulty using the washroom. Talking about the spatial distribution of objects, a person with dementia could have difficulty assessing distances and depths. So for example, if the person is uh, continuing to drive, they would have difficulty recognizing the, di the distances, assessing the distances between vehicles and therefore unable to change lanes in a safe manner. Or when the person with dementia is going down the stairs, they would have difficulty assessing the distance that is separating the steps and therefore experience severe difficulty in going down the stairs. Another common symptom associated with dementia is changes in mood and behavior. Now we all have changes in mood. How is our mood change different from the mood change experienced by someone with dementia? A person with dementia can have rapid mood swings without any reason. And also they are less likely to have control over their mood change, whereas we can control our emotions to some extent. Dementia is also associated with several behavior changes. In the initial stages, majority of ind individuals have some insight about the changes that is happening to them, that they are forgetting things, they are not able to make right decisions, they are making a lot of mistakes. And this can make the person actually very anxious, irritable, frustrated, and even afraid. But as the disease progresses, majority of individuals lose insight about what is exactly happening to them. And we would see several other behavior changes surfacing from that point. And these behavior changes include aggression, frustration, sleep disturbances, refusing to bathe, refusing to eat, and so on. Another common symptom associated with dementia is difficulty with day-to-day -day function. A person with dementia will have increasing difficulty carrying on with the activities of daily life, such as bathing, brushing their teeth, getting dressed, preparing their meals, and so on. So these are the common symptoms that are associated with dementia. When a person has a diagnosis of dementia, they are likely to have at least three of these six symptoms and they are likely to be severe enough to impact their daily life. 5% of dementia is actually caused by conditions that can be completely controlled and modified. And they are referred to as the reversible causes of dementia. Some of these causes include medications, particularly a group of medications called anticholinergics. What these medications do is decrease the level of a chemical in the brain 
called acetylcholine that the brain requires for normal messaging and functioning. So if any of these anticholinergic medications are taken on a high dose for a long period of time, a person is likely to experience symptoms of dementia. But if the medication is stopped in a timely manner, these symptoms go away. These medications include commonly prescribed allergy medications such as Benadryl, a group of antidepressants called tricyclic antidepressants, some bladder control medications, and some sleep medications. Another reversible cause of dementia is nutritional deficiencies. Therefore, dehydration and malnutrition can lead to symptoms of dementia. And when the person starts eating a healthy, balanced diet and starts drinking normal amount of fluids, the symptoms of dementia would go away. Another reversible cause of dementia is vitamin B12 deficiency. And this, this can be diagnosed by a simple blood test. The level of vitamin B12 in the blood will be low. And this can be corrected by taking vitamin B12 injections or sublingual tablets. Thyroid disease can also cause dementia. And this can be diagnosed again by a simple blood test. The level of thyroid hormone could be either excessively high or too low. And in either case, the condition can be treated with appropriate medications. Normal pressure hydrocephalus is another reversible cause of dementia. This refers to collection of cerebrospinal fluid in cavities of the brain called ventricles. The no common symptoms associated with normal pressure hydrocephalus are symptoms of dementia, difficulty walking, and loss of bladder control. If these symptoms are happening around the same time in an, indi in an individual between the ages of 60 to 80, they are likely to be due to normal pressure hydrocephalus. This is a condition that can be diagnosed by a CT scan. It will show collection of fluid in cavities of the brain, and this can be corrected by removing the extra fluid from the brain by a process called shunting. Another reversible cause of dementia is depression. And depression is a very important cause because untreated depression can increase the risk of dementia by 80%. So we need to be familiar with the common symptoms associated with depression. And these include having very sad thoughts, losing interest in the activities enjoyed before, having difficulty staying asleep, changes in appetite, feeling extremely tired for no reason, and so on. A person with depression could also have feelings of worthlessness and suicidal ideation. The good thing is that depression is a disease that can be controlled with medications. A person can be on an antidepressant that does not belong to the class of tricyclic antidepressants. In that manner, they can decrease their risk of developing dementia. Another reversible cause of dementia is delirium. And delirium refers to sudden change in mental state. Delirium is commonly caused by high fever and common infections such as urinary tract infection, pneumonia, flu, etc. The symptoms associated with delirium include confusion, disorientation, inability to think clearly, inability with decision making, and inability to communicate clearly. A person with delirium can also be aggressive. When these conditions are diagnosed in a timely manner and treated, they can actually reduce the risk of uh, dementia. Therefore, these are the reversible causes of dementia. 95% of dementia is caused by conditions that cannot be controlled or modified. They are called the non-reversible causes of dementia. The most common cause of dementia is Alzheimer's disease. It's believed that 64 to 66% of dementia is caused by Alzheimer's disease. Alzheimer's disease is a physical disease affecting the brain. On the left hand side, you see a picture of the normal brain. 
The purple structures are called the nerve cells or neurons. A healthy adult brain weighs three pounds and contains 100 billion neurons or nerve cells. Each of these nerve cells makes between 5,000 to 10,000 connections in the brain. So overall, a healthy adult brain weighs three pounds. It's made up of 100 billion neurons and has trillions of connections. We need these many neurons and these many connections to be able to fully function as a healthy individual. These connections and nerve cells ensure that messaging happens very quickly in the brain. On the right hand side, we see a picture of the Alzheimer's brain. The first change that is observed is abnormal collections of protein called amyloid plaques. These amyloid plaques come from a protein that is normally present in the brain called amyloid precursor protein. This undergoes some alterations and starts depositing in different parts of the brain as a sticky, gooey plaque. What the plaque does is actually slow down the communication that is happening between the cells. The plaques also destroy the connections between the cells so that the signals are not able to travel anywhere. They also cause another change to happen inside the nerve cell called the tangles, the neurofibrillary tangles. And these tangles are caused by another protein called tau protein, which forms part of a, a vital transport system in the brain. And when the tangles are formed, the transport system breaks down and the cell with the tangle ultimately dies because it is deprived of nutrients that it needs to survive and to function. As the disease progresses, there will be more and more of amyloid plaques slowing down the brain, destroying the connections, and more and more of tangles destroying the nerve cells one by one. And as these nerve cells die, the brain starts shrinking. This is a very slow disease. It's believed that the plaques and tangles start developing the brain 15 to 20 years before a person experiences the first symptom of memory loss. And by the time a person is diagnosed with dementia, they usually are well advanced into the disease. There are two types of Alzheimer's disease, familial and sporadic. Familial, as the name implies, is the inherited variety of Alzheimer's disease. It runs in families. It's caused by mutations in three chromosomes, chromosome 1, 14, and 21. Of these, the mutation on chromosome 14 that codes for the protein presenilin 1 is supposed to be the most predictive of Alzheimer's disease. Familial Alzheimer's disease usually manifests at an earlier age before the age of 65 and is more rapidly progressive. Fortunately, only 5% of Alzheimer's disease is familial. 95% of Alzheimer's disease is sporadic, which means that anybody can get the disease. One known risk factor of uh, Alzheimer's disease is advancing age. And as mentioned earlier, as we live longer to the age of 80 and above, one in three individuals can have the disease. Another component has also been identified for sporadic Alzheimer's disease, and that is genetic mutation on chromosome 19 that codes for a protein called APOE4. Individuals who have inherited that mutation are more likely to develop the disease compared to their peers. The sporadic variety of Alzheimer's disease usually appears at a late, later age, after the age of 65, and it is more slowly progressive. How do we diagnose dementia? Diagnosis of dementia is based on history, some blood test, imaging, and cognitive assessment. If your physician suspects that you could be developing dementia, several blood tests are ordered and these include tests to assess anemia, your thyroid function, electrolytes, kidney function, calcium levels, glucose, and vitamin B12. 
Unfortunately, we do not have a blood test yet for Alzheimer's disease, but a lot of research is progressing in that direction. The next step in the diagnostic process is imaging. CT scan is commonly used as a diagnostic tool. CT scan will help the physician identify any changes that's happening in the brain, such as shrinking in the brain, collection of fluid due to hydrocephalus, or damage caused by a brain tumor. The diagnostic workup also includes an MRI scan, which will show changes associated with vascular dementia or blood vessel changes. It will also show atrophy or shrinking of some vital parts of the brain, such as hippocampus. The workup also includes a special type of PET scan. In fact, there are two types of PET scan available. One is called the PIB PET scan. This is a very expensive PET scan exclusively reserved for research because it uses a radioactive isotope floor better pyr. The PIB PET scan can show the amyloid plaques and that's a way the physician can understand that some brain changes have already started happening. But the diagnostic value of a PIB PET scan is very limited. Why? Because just because someone has amyloid plaques does not mean that they are going on to develop Alzheimer's disease. What actually starts the process is the cascade that proceeds from plaque to the tangles to the destruction of cells and shrinking of the brain. So therefore, the diagnostic value of PIB PET scan is quite limited. What we have available in Calgary is another type of PET scan called FDG PET, and this stands for fluorodeoxyglucose PET scan. What this scan does is assess glucose metabolism in the brain. And what has been seen is that in whichever parts of the brain the nerve cells are dying, the cells are unable to utilize glucose. And therefore, by mapping the glucose utilization in the brain, physicians can find out whether nerve cells are dying in a particular part of the brain or not. And therefore, FDG PET scan has got more diagnostic significance. The diagnostic workup also includes cognitive assessment and the MOCA test, which is an abbreviation for Montreal Cognitive Assessment Test, is a commonly used cognitive assessment test. This test is used to assess the cognitive functioning in the brain. It assesses several cognitive domains, such as memory, uh, verbal recall, executive decision-making, ability to recognize patterns, and so on. A MOCA score above 26 is considered healthy, whereas a score below 24 is supposed to be consistent with mild cognitive impairment. Going on to medications for Alzheimer's disease, currently we have four medications available, Aricept, Exelon, Reminil, and Abixa. But the most important thing to remember is that these medications do not cure the disease or slow down the progression of the disease. So you might wonder, what do these medications do? Three of these medications, Aricept, Exelon, and Reminil, increase the level of a chemical in the brain called acetylcholine. So that is all that these medications do. And they allow the remaining nerve cells to function a little more efficiently. The fourth medication, that is Ebixa, decreases the level of a harmful chemical in the brain called glutamate, which is released in the brain when the nerve cells die. So we see that none of these medications actually target the plaques or the tangles which are responsible for the brain changes associated with Alzheimer's disease. Aricept, Exelon and Reminil are indicated for mild to moderate disease, whereas Ebixa is intended for the later stages of the disease, and Ebixa is not covered by Alberta Blue Cross. There's a lot of ongoing research happening in this direction of treating Alzheimer's disease. And the two most important uh, research initiatives happening right now are the A4 study, which stands for Anti-Amyloid Antibody Against Alzheimer's Disease. In this trial, we are using an anti-amyloid vaccine. 
which is supposed to remove amyloid plaques from the brain. Initially, the anti-amyloid vaccine was tried on individuals with a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, but the vaccine failed because of the huge amyloid load in the brain. So currently, this medication is tried on individuals who do not have a diagnosis of the disease yet, but they either have genetic mutations that could cause the disease or they have PET scan evidence of amyloid plaques in the brain. Another significant study that's happening is the base inhibitor. Base inhibitors are medications that reduce the formation of plaques in the brain, whereas anti-amyloid vaccines remove plaques from the brain. Base inhibitor studies are currently going on in United States and several parts of the world and both these trials have showed a lot of success in the initial stages and have entered phase three trials. Moving on to other non-reversible types of dementia. The next common type of dementia is vascular dementia. Purely vascular dementia accounts for 13% of dementia. But in reality, several individuals with Alzheimer's disease also have vascular dementia. Vascular dementia is caused by interruption of blood flow to the brain, which causes the nerve cells to die. So vascular dementia can follow a single massive stroke, which affects a large part of the brain, or it could, affect, it could follow a series of tiny strokes, where tiny areas of the brain are affected due to lack of blood flow. The ultimate symptoms of vascular dementia depend on the part of the brain that is affected. But there are several early symptoms that are characteristic of vascular dementia. These include confusion, depression, inability to think clearly, difficulty with decision making, and emotional liability. Vascular dementia is the only preventable type of dementia because it is closely related to our cardiovascular health. Whereas we have no control over the plaques and tangles happening in our brain, this is a dementia that can be completely controlled. Another non-reversible dementia is the Lewy body dementias. Lewy body dementias include dementia with Lewy body and Parkinson's disease dementia. Lewy body dementias is caused by another protein called alpha synuclein protein that forms inclusion bodies in different parts of the brain. This disease was formally diagnosed by Dr. Frederick Louis in 1912 and hence gets its name Louis body dementia. The core symptoms of Louis body dementia include fluctuating cognition, meaning that the intellectual capabilities fluctuate on a daily basis, so that a person could be highly functioning on a particular day and very poorly functioning on another day. Another common symptom includes visual hallucinations, that is seeing things that are not there. And the visual hallucinations of Lewy body dementia are unique in that the affected person would see tiny animals, tiny people, and tiny cartoon characters. Another common symptom associated with Lewy body dementia is symptoms of Parkinson's disease. Uh, which includes rigidity, shuffling gait, downward gaze, and slow and shuffling movements. Lewy body dementias include, as I mentioned earlier, dementia with Lewy body and Parkinson's disease dementia. Both of them are different presentations of the same disease entity. If the person is presenting with motor symptoms, then they are more likely to be diagnosed as Parkinson's disease dementia if the dementia symptoms develop after a period of one year or more. But if the dementia symptoms and the motor symptoms are happening around the same time or within a span of one year, the person is likely to be diagnosed as dementia with Lewy body. Lewy body dementia commonly affects individuals between the ages of 60 and 80 and males are slightly more affected than females. Again, this is an incurable type of dementia. Another interesting variety of uh, non-reversible dementia is frontotemporal lobe dementia. 
In this particular type of dementia, nerve cells are dying in two particular parts of the brain, that is the frontal lobe in front and the temporal lobe on the side. The frontal lobe is called the executive center of the brain and it's responsible for functions such as planning, organizing, decision making, initiative, personality and social skills. The temporal lobe is the seat of memory and language. So when nerve cells are dying in these two parts of the brain, the person can exhibit difficulty in all these areas. There are three different presentations of frontotemporal lobe dementia. One type is the behavioral variant, where the person presents with change in personality, difficulty with decision making, and loss of inhibitions leading to inappropriate behavior. The second common variety of frontotemporal lobe dementia is a language variant, where the main part of the brain affected is the temporal lobe, and the person could present either with um, difficulty finding words and being non-fluent, or being very fluent but making no sense. Third variety of frontotemporal lobe dementia is the one associated with motor neuron disease. 10 to 15 percent of people with frontotemporal lobe dementia can develop motor neuron disease where they develop progressive paralysis and weakening of vital muscles. So the person could experience difficulty swallowing, they could have difficulty getting in and out of a car, going up and down the stairs, so movement uh, difficulty with movement is possible and the disease progresses with development of respiratory paralysis. But fortunately, only 10 to 15 percent of people with frontotemporal lobe dementia go down that route. Frontotemporal lobe dementia usually affects younger people between the ages of 40 and 70. Another common variety of dementia is the mixed dementia. And this refers to a condition where the person has more than one type of dementia. The common mix is vascular dementia. So it's possible for a person with Alzheimer's disease to have vascular dementia or someone with Lewy body dementia to have vascular dementia. This makes the diagnosis as well as treatment extremely challenging. Then there is another small category that's called uh, other types of dementia. This includes the rare types of dementia such as Korsakoff syndrome, which is caused by vitamin B1 or thymine deficiency. There is also Down syndrome dementia, multiple system atrophy, MSA, CJD, that's called Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, and CTE, which is a dementia that is associated with head injury and common among hockey players boxers and football players. All these types of dementia are very rare. That concludes our segment on understanding dementia. If you need more information, please visit our website alzheimercalgary.ca. Thank you for your time.